You know I love epistemology, right? The study of how we know what we know. And it was high time I dedicated a whole episode to this topic. And what better guest than Aubrey Clayton to do that? The author of the book Bernoulli's Fallacy, Statistical Illogic and the Crisis of Modern Science. I'm in the middle of reading it and really, it's a great read. Aubrey is a mathematician in Boston who teaches the philosophy of probability and statistics at the Harvard Extension School. He holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of California, Berkeley, and his writing has appeared in Pacific Standard, Nautilus, and the Boston Globe. We talked about what he deems a catastrophic error in the logic of the standard statistical methods in almost all the sciences, and why this error manifests even outside of science in fields like medicine, law, public policy, etc. But don't worry, we are not doomed. We'll also see where we go from there. As a big fan of E.T. Jane's, Aubrey will also tell us how this US scientist influenced his own thinking as well as the field of Bayesian inference in general. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 51, recorded September 9, 2021. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayestats.com. That's learnbayestats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash learnbayestats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash learnbayestats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Less a Bayesian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. aubrey clayton welcome to learning patient statistics thank you thank you for having me yeah you bet i'm really excited for this episode you are working on topics i personally love so history of statistics epistemology philosophy of statistics and basically how we can know what we know. So I love these topics. I, I have personally started watching your videos on your website that you have on YouTube, uh, especially the, the series you have about uh, E.T. Jane's book. So yeah, I definitely recommend that to listeners and the link will be in the show notes. So yeah, thanks a lot for doing that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. Yeah, I can, as a content creator myself, I can imagine that took you a lot of time. <laughs> so. It was a lot of time, and it, but it was also it was in you know the early days of YouTube. It's been quite a while now since I did those, and I remember having this kind of feeling of freedom, like I was looking for an outlet for this content or somewhere to present it, and then it just occurred to me, oh, you can just do this on YouTube. You can just make videos, and nobody can stop you. And then anybody who searches for these keywords might come find them, or even if they don't. The videos are there and preserved for a decade or more. So actually, in a way, it was much more easy than it had any right to be and than I expected it to be. But I'm, I'm so thrilled that people keep finding that and keep leaving little positive comments here and there. And it still seems to mean something to people. Yeah, that's great. And, and hopefully you'll see a, a bump in the view. <laughs> Maybe. It's, yeah, it's, I, I get nothing from those. So it's not at all. I have no financial incentive. But oh, yeah, I am extremely thrilled that that they're there. Uh, the production qualities are pretty bad by 2021 standards, so I guess I should warn people. Don't go in expecting. Oh no, like... it's, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I watched that. I watched that during lunch. <laughs> yeah, it's no, nice. it's perfect for for a phone sized uh, screen while you're eating lunch. 
that's ideal. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, so definitely encourage people to go there. Your only incentive in, in that is that people discover more ET Chain's work and maybe even read the book and get something from that yes. uh, in their own life, in their own way of thinking about, okay, how can I be sure that I know what I know? Absolutely. Or that something I believe in is true or not, if that's your goal. Some people don't have the goal of having true beliefs. I am all about true beliefs. And I think E.T. Jane's is a great conduit to thinking about those ideas and clarifying some of the the more difficult points and the things that have been shrouded in controversy. And it's yeah. just a very kind of radical thinker. And I think it's great and disruptive for people to encounter some radical ideas that are yeah. just contrary to the mainstream. So he quite a good writer. So I think that's why the book still has traction. It's that it's not written. It's not the boring writing, I should say. It's it's really interesting and, and quite well written with good examples and, and also also funny to read. Like some of his paper also are very funny. Um, totally. One of his paper about the difference between uh, Bayesian confidence interval, like Bayesian credibility interval and frequentist uh, uh, confidence interval is is like actually quite funny to read. I already mentioned this this paper on, on the podcast. If people want to read that, and that, that that there is probably something about that in the book, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's it. most of the way I understand it. I mean, he developed his material over many decades and published incrementally, and then it all got wrapped up into this omnibus treatment, which was he was still working on when he died, and unfortunately, it's yeah. still incomplete. It is really all encompassing and a, and a complete theory. And from A to Z of really probability and statistics and yeah. you know epistemology really yeah when it comes to that's it. fascinating topics and by the through the magic of time travel when people hear your episode they will have heard episode fifty with David uh, Spiegelhalter where we exactly talked about that like how to reason and communicate about trees can uncertainty. I'm sure people will see parallels and maybe will get annoyed with my obsession with these topics. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my podcast, yeah. so <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have a prior on your answer to the second question I will ask you at the very end of the podcast, but we'll see. So let's go and, and talk about your background, actually, and, and start by that, because you are teaching philosophy of probability now, but you haven't started that way. Did you? No, I, I didn't. I really, I came into this subject from essentially a pure math background. I was getting my math PhD at Berkeley, and I had, I really loved the subject, and I had gotten very deeply immersed in mathematical probability. I came into it from really a background in analysis, you know, real and complex analysis and harmonic analysis. And I found the subject of probability that it has all of the amazing ingredients of analysis and measure theory and the convergence theorems of the kinds of things you, you get in theory of random variables and stochastic processes. It's just like a fascinating, amazing, rich, beautiful topic. And it also has this kind of hint of a real world connection that everything is ultimately in some way tethered to games of chance or gambling or random phenomena. And so I think I, I was really attracted to it for those reasons. But it, thinking back on those days, I think what's amazing about it is how far you can really get into the mathematical theory of probability without really ever confronting questions of what does probability mean philosophically or what is the epistemological role of probability. And I, I had a, this kind of epiphany or crisis, depending on how you look at it, about midway through finishing my program there that I, I had been doing all this stuff and I, I knew every theorem in the book about essentially measure theory, but I didn't really know what probability was. And I didn't know what you what it really meant when you say the probability is X of raining tomorrow or someone living to be 100 or some uh, candidate getting elected to um, political office. And it was really destabilizing to have spent that much time studying probability and never really have grappled with, okay, but what does this actually mean? So I think that was how I got interested in philosophy. And that's where I have gone since then is like giving up some of the mathematical pursuit and caring more about, all right, what is this actually doing for us in our practical lives and in our abilities to make sense of the world? Yeah, I can see why I was introduced to you by Wilker that listeners should know about. He he came on episode 16 of the show and also matchmaking dinner. I think it was the first matchmaking dinner that I did. So the, the other format I have on the show only for patrons. 
And uh, yeah, I can really see the, the the parallels in your in your personal path here. Yeah, Will and I are on a similar wavelength. And shout out to yeah. Count Basie and Will Card for bringing me into the fold a little bit and showing me what's possible in terms of writing about probability for a general audience. I think it's he does amazing things, yeah. and it's it's a great example to follow. We talked about one of Will's favorite ideas in in statistics on the show and it was the D. Jane's mind projection fallacy so I mean, <laughs> yeah it's not surprising <laughs> not at all that, no. that he referred to refer to you as a as a guest on the podcast and will if you are listening uh, thanks a lot then for introducing us and that's about your background but what do you do nowadays like how would you define what you're doing yeah these days i'm doing i'm doing a number of different things most notably recently i have my book bernoulli's fallacy statistical logic on the crisis of science which is the culmination of many years of trying to put ideas of james's really treatment of probability into it an accessible form for a general audience and and so i'm i'm doing that sort of thing in, in a few different other kinds of arenas. So I'm teaching probability, philosophy, and logic of probability at the Harvard Extension School. I am writing a fair amount regularly, contributing to the Boston Globe. I write occasionally for Nautilus magazine. But it's all, I think, it's organized under the same heading, which is essentially spreading the gospel of Bayesianism, maybe more generally, like equipping people at, at different levels of sophistication with the tools to think about probability the right way and maybe avoid the traps and the pitfalls and the things about probability that are tempting but counterintuitive and you know ultimately dangerous when they have serious real world kind of consequences. So I think that's applicable for people who are doing research science, people who are teaching statistics, people who are coming into data science maybe for the first time, and as well as people who are just consuming the news and reading about statistics and probability and current events and things like COVID statistics and criminal justice and every everything is steeped in this language of statistics and probability. But I think without the kind of proper training, it's very easy to get led astray and, and to, to fall into some of these classic kind of fallacies. So that's really what my mission in life is at the moment. I think there's a quote, I open up my book with this quote from Demois that I think about a lot that he wrote in 17, 18 or thereabouts that, that his purpose in, in writing the book was to help people to distinguish truth from what seems so nearly to resemble it. And I think that's really something that's inherent in the study of probability, that there are these things that if you don't think about them too much, they seem true. But if you can easily get spun around in circles and led into sort of contradictions and paradoxes, unless you have a real grounding and are able to slowly think your way through a problem and, and go back to first principles almost. So that's that's what I want to try to do with things like the book and, and my teaching and, and writing. Yeah. And do you, like, do you know why that's important to you to try and help people n not be trapped by, by like, uh, uh, fallacies, let's say? Because you, you could clearly be like, okay, I, I, I love studying that and being aware of all that, but not have that drive for pedagogy and, and trying to spread the word about that. Yeah, I think a lot of it is, is drawn from my own experience and struggling with probability and coming into it late in my academic studies. I had seen it as a student a number of times. And as I said, I got very heavily into the math of it as a grad student, but I I was always a little bit naive, I think, about the philosophical side of things. And having gone through that experience and now I think Probably a lot of people who have, you know, studied Bayesian statistics have this experience where you learn about these ideas and then suddenly like the world goes from black and white to color and you just see things in an entirely new way. And I think having had that experience myself, I, I really want to share that with people because I do think that a lot depends on our ability to conceptualize probabilities the right way. Probably no surprise to, to you and your listeners, but probability is a very important conceptual framework for making sense of the world and it guides decision making at every level of every level of significance from the smallest individuals to society at large and it's, it's it's a major part of the rhetoric that we use to make arguments about what we should do and about what's scientifically understood and i think as i say in the book that the idea that there's something wrong with the way that the dominant kind of paradigm of thinking about probability and statistics 
I think should be a terrifying proposition to people. I think it, it should really strike fear in people to think about how much is really riding on this and how much depends on the tools and the language that we use to talk about uncertainty and risk and inference. So that's really why I think that the stakes are especially high. It's not just solving brain teasers, like making sure you understand the Monty Hall problem or something. I think you have to get your head around those things so that you can take them into the real world and, and understand statistics about healthcare and disease and the environment and, and everything that's actually of, of great importance. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I'm the same in, in a lot of ways. I do have a podcast dedicated <laughs> to, to, to that and, and, and also talk about these topics quite a lot. It's always so, uh, interesting to see uh, what motivates each of us to, to do that. And actually, that's great. That's a great segue to talk about your book now, A Bernalese Fantasy, that you just released in August 2021. So I'm curious, how did it come to life? Yeah, it was it was a very long process, unsurprisingly. It really started with, so my experiences in grad school and, and struggling to understand what was known about the philosophy of probability. Mm -hmm. And then finding just by accident, basically finding E.T. Jane's probability theory, the logic of science. And I think it, it had not even been out for that long at that point. It was only a few years old and really digging into that and having it open my eyes and then feeling like this is now what I want to do. This is my my mission in life is going to be taking these ideas, spreading them, trying to make them more accessible, fleshing them out when I can. And so I had tried many times to do something like that. And I made the series of YouTube videos that you mentioned, and I had sort of reading courses and I started teaching. But I, I thought I really, I would love to put this into a book form and, and try to get it out there to a wider audience. And I happened to be thinking about several things simultaneously. And I think I had one of these kinds of magical confluences of ideas where things just lined up. I was, it was around 2018, summer of 2018. And I was, I was almost about to turn 39. I was thinking about like my life <laughs> and uh, I had a small child and I was thinking about what kind of legacy do I want to leave behind? And I was also reading a lot about the history of statistics and I was reading about Jacob Bernoulli, just for interest. And it also happened to be that there was a lot of news at that time about the replication crisis. And I knew that was something that was on people's minds. And so it started to coalesce that I think that these two things are related to each other. I think that I can tell a story about the history of statistics going back to Bernoulli in you know, the late, seven, late 1600s, early 1700s, that connects his way of thinking about probability and statistics, which I think is logically flawed with what's happening now with the replication crisis and the dominant school of frequentist statistics. And I can draw sort of a continuous line from one to the other. And I think that would create some interest for people to learn about other ways of thinking about probability or just that I could use that as a vehicle to put some of the best ideas from Jane's in a sort of responsa, like what would Jane's have to say about the replication? And so it all clicked together. And then I had been doing some writing at the time and I, I was able to put together a proposal and find a publisher and, and the rest is history. So here we are. <laughs> yeah. And I'm curious, like, how did you like notice or discover the, this fantasy that you're talking about? How did you come up with that? Yeah. So I think, first of all, I should say as a disclaimer, I don't think that this is something that I came up with or that's original to me. I think all these ideas basically have been around almost as long as there's been mathematical probability and statistics. So I think people who are acquainted with that controversy will probably find a lot of what I'm saying familiar. But essentially, I was thinking about just how much I hated frequentist statistics and, and p-values um, particularly, and just how frustrated I get at hearing the kind of party line of the justification for things like significance testing from frequentist apologists and statisticians. And I had these kind of two, two ideas in my mind that I really wanted to get out there. And the first is that there's something just inherently wrong with the idea that improbable data, like something being improbable under a model assumption or under a hypothesis is somehow evidence against it, which is really the sort of at the core of what frequentist methods are all about. And the idea that you can make decisions about models or hypotheses without without priors, right? Mm -hmm. So without including prior information or prior probability assignments. And these two things were just bouncing around in my head. And I, I was thinking, I really want to express these two ideas. And then I, I came around to the thinking that actually those are really the same thing. And that if you really go back to the beginning of 
probability and statistics and you look and you read Bernoulli and you read the way that he used the law of large numbers as a tool of statistical inference, he's committing both of these mistakes at the same time. And the reason is that he's trying to do statistical inference based only on the sampling probability of the data. And that's what I decided is the real heart of the issue. And so I was going to call that Bernoulli's fallacy just to name what I felt like was really the kind of most prominent source of it. But ultimately, that is the fallacy that, that carries through today in frequentist statistics and is what you're really experiencing when you hear people talk about p-values and significance testing and, and so on and so forth. Yet that was, the again, the, the moment where everything clicked was these things that, that are bothering me today, I could find in this text 300 years ago and that I could somehow draw a line, maybe skipping through history to, to try to tell a continuous narrative from one to the other. I thought that was... That was very exciting. So when that happened, I think I it, it was the rest of it was just clear. I knew the title of the book. I knew how it was going to be organized. I knew what the thesis was going to be, and and the words just came out. But that it took probably fifteen years to get to that point hmm. of just really wanting to get James's ideas out there and make more people aware of the fact that there are other ways of thinking about probability and statistics that are not what you're taught in AP stats. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I, um, yeah, I love the fact that you it's an idea that really stuck with you for so long. And I haven't read your book yet, but I'm pretty looking forward to it. It's, it's in my... I have the extract on my Kindle, so it will come soon. But yeah, can you then tell us what this error is, this fallacy that you think Bernoulli made and that you argue is it's really a catastrophic error in the in the logic and that we encounter in almost all the scientists uh, sciences. So, what is this error and where does it come from? Sure. Yeah. So I think I, you know, I hinted at a little bit already that really for me the error is it's making or attempting to make inferences in a statistical kind of setup based only on what I call the sampling probabilities of the data. And I think I'm taking that from Jane's mm-hmm. as well. So that is, you, know, you have a data generation process, you have a model, a sampling model, whatever it is, and it tells you if a hypothesis is true, the probability of the data would be such and such. And the, so the fallacy, the way I sort of argue in the book, is that is not enough ingredients to make good decisions about the hypothesis given that data. Where this comes from with Bernoulli was he was really thinking about extending probability beyond the realms of dice and and card games and things like that, where probabilities are just manifest. You have um, the number of ways of rolling a 10 with three dice, you can just calculate it. But what he wanted to do was say, what if we're in a situation where we don't know the probability or we don't know some physical quantity that determines the probability. So like the mix of pebbles in an urn, say black and white pebbles in an urn, how can we learn that by observation? And his argument was, there's this mathematical theorem, which is you know completely true statement of fact that if you take a large enough sample, that the no matter what the kind of hypothetical, let's say mix of pebbles in the urn is, what you're going to get in the sample with high probability is going to be close to that. So if X is the unknown, and Y is what you can observe, then you can say with high probability, Y is going to be close to X, and this is the law of large numbers. And you have to be precise about what you mean by by close and with high probability. Bernoulli called that moral certainty. And so then the, the fallacy is really then saying, okay, now that we've done that, we've done the experiment, we knew that with high probability, X was going to be close to Y. So therefore, can't we just conclude that whatever, if we have, whatever we observed was Y, that it's highly probable that X, the unknown, is close to our observation. So it can reverse this idea of closeness. If X is close to Y, then Y is close to X. And it just turns out that's not true. It's very easy to produce counterexamples where that doesn't work out. And basically, the reason that it doesn't work out is you might have strong prior information, prior probability assignments about the values of X, that then given some value of Y, you would actually not conclude necessarily that it's, that it's close to Y, or you'd have in the full Bayesian paradigm, you'd have a posterior distribution and it might not actually tell you that it's very close to what you've observed. But I think that this is a kind of very tempting, one of these sorts of traps that I mentioned earlier, that if you're just thinking loosely and intuitively and you're not going through the derivation step by step, you could easily get yourself turned around like that. And you could say, no, actually that, that kind of makes rhetorical sense. And that's really what, what leads to frequentist statistics and things like Fisher 
in significance testing tried to come up with a method of statistical inference that didn't include prior probabilities, didn't allow for prior information, and relied on this kind of idea. And, and in Fisher's case, he called it fiducial inference because there's this concept in surveying that you can have a fixed point or if you're measuring the distance between two things, you can think of either one as the fixed point and the other one is variable. And from either perspective, you're just measuring the same distance. And it just doesn't work. Probability just does not work that way. And the kind of fundamental logical argument that, you know, if what we observe will, with high probability, be close to this hypothetical quantity, therefore we can reverse the conditionality around and say therefore what we want to know is conditionally close to what we've observed. It's just not true. But I think that that is one of these kinds of tempting little slogans that persuades people to think about probability and statistics in frequentist terms, because the ingredients of that are just frequencies, right? The probabilities of observed data are empirically verifiable. And that was Bernoulli's whole ambition from the stories. He wanted to be able to use experiment only to learn about unknown probabilities and to make inferences about things. So really, I think that's the kind of surface level description. But when you really get down to it, Underneath all that is a kind of a way of thinking about scientific philosophy and inference and the question of whether you can learn things objectively or whether there's always going to be some kind of subjective interpretation on the part of the observer. And I think what I want to argue in the book is that statistics has made this false promise that we can do things objectively when really we should never have been searching out objectivity. We should have from the beginning, we should have understood that you can only make inferences based on what you assume about the world and the way things work. And you can only decide between things if you have alternatives at the ready and you have prior information about what's likely. Right. So that's the case for ultimately Bayesian statistics. But I think that to get there, you have to first understand why, what is it about frequent statistics that people find so attractive? And for me, it comes back to this kind of fallacy of Bernoulli and his original work in 1700. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And so, yeah, to so to you, like to sum up, it's a misunderstanding of the quantification of chance, like it's an understanding of the idea of probability. Yeah, I think so. Really, I think when you push this far enough, you end up if you were having this argument with, say, someone who was committed to frequent statistics. At the end of the day, you're going to be arguing about what probability is, because. I think in the Bayesian way of thinking about things, you have to be able to do things like assign probabilities to hypotheses or parameter values or propositions about the world, which just obviously do not have a frequency associated to them. And then the question is, where do those probabilities come from? And you have to reckon with the fact that it's up to you. It's dependent on your state of information and your knowledge and ignorance combined, it gives you a probability assessment. And that's just a fundamentally different way of approaching probability from someone who wants probability to be entirely empirical and something outside you, right? Something that you can observe and tally up. And through experimentation, you can measure the probability the same way you can measure electrical resistance or mass or whatever. And I think that until you've gotten over that kind of philosophical hurdle, there's no reconciling these camps. And there's no way around this. But I think the the fallacy, as I would describe it, is trying to build a, a, a method of inference using only these empirical pieces. Because really, in inference, what you want is a probability of a hypothesis. You don't care so much about the probability of data because the data is usually the only thing that's given to you. So the fact that you could have gotten other data doesn't really matter too much. What matters is what do you do based on that observation? How do you update your probability assignments about what's true? And how do you fold that into your prior understanding of the world? So I think that's, like I you know, said, it's a very different way of approaching scientific inference. But I think it's the one that actually is necessary to avoid some of the kinds of ramifications that things like we're seeing in, in the replication crisis, the things like practical real world examples of this fallacy leading us into bad inferences and bad decision making. I think if you want to get out of that, you have to you have to get your head around thinking about probability as something more than just frequency. Yeah, okay. That's interesting because that relates to something that David Spiegelhalter said in, in episode 50, I think, where uh, he basically says, to simplify that, uh, probably you can't really pin down something that's objective and that's the probability of that one given person to have 
a probability of getting of developing a, a liver cancer, for instance, that the best you can say is based on, on the people who have similar features as yours, we think uh, like among 100 people like that, we expect three of them to develop that kind of, of disease. And so that's why he's arguing that probability doesn't exist. I feel like it's related to what you're saying here, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's Definetti, I think, originally said that probability does not exist. And um, I think that's totally right on. I, I guess another way to say is that it exists, but it exists as something in our minds and something in relation to the world as we observe it, and also our prior assumptions and our prior information, or what we know about a proposition, what we don't know about it. I think those are all the ingredients that, that go into a probability. It's basically a quantification of what we know and don't know. And so I would even probably be a little bit more, more radical and say it has nothing to do with how many people of a similar character end up developing a disease or whatever. It's what do you know about this person and what assignment do you make based on what you know about them or maybe what you've seen in similar people in the past? I think for me, again, going back to encountering Janes for the first time in the midst of struggling with all this, the quote that really hooked me and the thing that got me to be a convert to the school of Janes was somewhere early on in, in the book, he talks about probabilities and experimentation and frequencies. And he says something like that we could no more verify this probability assignment by experimentation, then we could verify a boy's love for his dog by performing experiments on the dog. And I just thought that's the perfect encapsulation. I'm going to remember this forever because it's it's not about the object per se or the experiment per se. It's about our relationship to it and our knowledge of it. And so you can't externalize that and say, I, I will measure the probability somehow by by running the experiment a number of times and tallying up frequencies. That's never going to help you understand what you know about it and what information you're bringing to the table when you make that probability assignment. Okay, I see. But then my question would be, if probability doesn't exist, why, why do we care about that? Yeah, so I guess I, I, I was that maybe I would draw the distinction that it exists maybe in the way that music exists and language exists and love exists. Mm. It exists as a construct between people. And I think as a it's a useful vocabulary to use to talk about knowledge and uncertainty. And the other kind of framework for me that I try to express in the book that, you know, it's, it's really where Jane's comes from is that probability is a kind of extension of logical reasoning, that you have deductive logic, this tool that has been around since Aristotle and, and probably earlier that we use all the time when we maybe make decisions about pure logical situations, but really what's needed is something that helps us make assessments when we don't have all of the steps in a logical syllogism to really uh, lead to a perfect deductive conclusion. And so Jane says probability is that tool. It's, it's something that goes beyond just true and false and gives you a quantitative range to assign to the plausibility of a proposition given some background information, and you can update based on what you've observed. And it's a continuous process of redoing those assignments, but that actually all of deductive logic fits inside of probability, that deductive logic is essentially just probability reasoning where the probabilities are one and zero. But so like Bayes' theorem for, for Jane's is logical deduction. It's the, the deductive step of the logical syllogism, but it just allows you to have numbers that are not one and zero. And I think it's just a, that's a beautiful way of conceptualizing probability. And, it, and I, to me that, I think it c correctly situates probability as being as big as it really is. It describes probability in the right kind of grandiose terms to say it is really about how we think about the world, given that we never have perfect knowledge of any proposition around us. And in, in a mathematical sense, in the kind of Cox theorem, Jane's presentation, you can even prove that if you do those plausibility assignments in a way that is consistent logically, that it is, it's isomorphic to probability. You can put it on a scale that makes it mathematically identical to probability. And so that's very desirable. That's something that I think everybody should want in their lives. But it doesn't exist in the sense that it's not outside of us. It's not something that you can measure experimentally. And I think that's, that is the other kind of radical proposition from Jane's that, that I really carry through in, in this book, or at least that's something that's, that's been very meaningful to me as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I can clearly see that. That's super uh, useful, even in your, like, your everyday life to think about scientific topics.
And actually, you say in the book that you're seeing this error, this fantasy manifest even outside of science in topics like medicine or law or public policy. So I'm curious, why do you say that? Yeah, so I think when you, again, when you deconstruct the logic of this approach to probability inference, you start to recognize it as being very similar to other sorts of mistaken inferences. And so I think what I try to accomplish in the book is to draw an analogy between significance testing and frequentist statistics with things like base rate neglect, which is famous in the world of medicine, and something that we now have, unfortunately, lots of practical experience with, with COVID tests and accuracy rates that those tests might have, or a test for a disease might have, let's say, a rate of false negatives and a rate of false positives. And what those mean, their definitions, are the rates with which you would get certain test results if, hypothetically, a person had the disease or didn't have the disease. Okay, so there's sampling probabilities. And then the question is, okay, so let's say someone comes in, doesn't have any other symptoms, but then tests positive for the disease. What do you assess to be their likelihood of having the disease? And you cannot make that decision just based on the accuracy rates of the test, right? In order to correctly process that inference, you have to know their prior likelihood, or you have to have an assignment of their prior likelihood. Is this a very rare disease you're talking about? What are the incidents rates like in their community? How often would somebody similar showing whatever constellation of symptoms they're, they're showing turn out to have the disease? And if you don't factor that in, you'll be led to some very bad inferences. So you'll say, okay, this is a very accurate test. It's 99% accurate. You tested positive, therefore it's highly likely you have the disease. And that is just exactly Bernoulli's moral certain closeness argument. That's saying it is the case that it's morally certain that no matter what disease status you have, your test result will match that status. But that does not mean that given a positive test result, it's morally certain that you were a true positive if, for example, it's a very rare disease. So that's the kind of the medical side of that. And I think you can easily see the analogy to trying to build up a a method of inference that just uses the accuracy rates of the test, basically the probability. In law, this comes up all the time, too. There's a thing called the prosecutor's fallacy, which I'm sure you've talked about it, you know, a bunch of times. And that is Really, at the bottom of it, it's the same kind of template of argument. Cases like Sally Clark, who I write about in the book, she was convicted of murder for two children because the argument was, if she was innocent, it would be very unlikely for her two children to have died under the conditions that they did. So therefore, she must, with very high probability, not be innocent. And again, that's a way of doing that inference that doesn't factor into the consideration the prior probability that it should be very unlikely that she committed double murder, because that is also a very unlikely proposition. So if you allow for that prior information to answer into the reasoning process, you can assemble the pieces correctly. And maybe you'd say it's somewhat likely, it's suspicious, but it's not proof beyond reasonable doubt. It's not conclusive. So that's, I think, if you buy that those are fallacies, the sort of rhetorical move of the book is to establish first that those are fallacies and then say, now look, you can see the same thing happening in statistics, right? So if you then reason through the logic of a p-value or significance test, you'll see it's exactly the same thing. It's an attempt to make a decision about a scientific hypothesis based only on the sampling probability of the data. How likely would the data have been if the hypothesis were true? And that just doesn't work in any of these other contexts. It doesn't work in science either. So that's how I think of the fallacy manifesting itself in many different places. It's also no coincidence that people who are doing that doing those fallacies, you know, making that the testimony or making those medical decisions, they're trained in statistics. And it's, I think it's a habit of thinking statistically that somehow that's all is the sampling probabilities of the data when you, you really do need more. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I agree that it's even more concerning when it's uh, people trained in statistics uh, who do that, because it, when it's a politician or, or lay people or journalists, it's, it's a shame, but uh, you can blame ignorance on their part. And it's when it's statisticians, it's even worse because then uh, people have more faith in what they are uh, saying and in the conclusion they are reaching, yeah. uh, which can have uh, really tra- tragic consequences, at least in, in the case of Sally Clark. Exactly. And so I think it's no surprise when you think about it, because that is what orthodox statistical methods teach them. That's the orthodox training of statistics. And probably people who no statistics would say that was an incorrect application of statistics in those cases. So those people clearly should have been taking into consideration the prior probabilities of the disease or whatever. But what I think is needed is some introspection to say, no, actually, all they were doing was following the same logical template that you 
gave your blessing to for t-tests and linear regression. So why is it that for this special circumstance, they should do things a different way? It's, it's completely to be expected that if you think this way of reasoning is correct in one domain, that someone would transfer that into another domain. Yeah, exactly. And actually, um, before taking about like, how do we solve that, I'm curious if you could talk about the story of all that, because I love a lot of history of sciences and how we got to where we are. And uh, what I love in your book is that you, you go into the story of probability as one of politics, of theology, of feuds between competing schools and even between competing people. It's not only mathematical merits, but it's also just being at the right time, at the right place, uh, at the right place at the right time, having charisma and yeah, having some bad human tendencies. And can you talk a bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So that was the, the big part of the story that I didn't feel like I knew before writing the book and something that I, I desperately wanted yeah. to understand better. I felt like I, I could write a short little treatment about the logical problems of statistics. And you know, people have more or less heard that story before. And maybe a couple of the ideas from Jane's are new, but by and large, this is old territory. But I think what was really driving me was to understand, okay, how did we get here? How did it come to be that the dominant way of doing statistics is what it is and is subject to these fallacies that you can demonstrate with a simple kind of example? And I think that there are many threads of that answer that ultimately emerged as I was trying to reconstruct that story from 1700 to present day. So I think it's impossible to really do it justice because it's such a long history and has so many people involved. But for me, it ultimately comes down to, I think that the simultaneous growth of statistical methods and social science that starting with Bernoulli and Laplace and people who wanted to do things with probability outside of resolving gambling disputes. They wanted to use it as a tool of inference in, in many different kinds of real world applications, in particular, understanding people and their lives and society and culture, that as they did that, as they extended that territorial domain of probability, that frequentism started to emerge as the kind of interpretation of probability that people relied on more and more. Okay, So I think that this really took off in the mid-19th century. And I, I talk a lot about Adolphe Quetelet, the pioneering social scientist who was ruffling a lot of feathers by trying to take methods of statistics from astronomy and applying them to what he called social physics. And that made a lot of people nervous and upset. And I think that the idea that probability means frequency, it must mean frequency because that means that it's empirical and it's objective and it's not something that has any kind of prejudice involved in making these decisions. I think that really took off in response to, to that discomfort and that, that kind of backlash to probability in real questions of society. And so that, in my mind, is, is completely contiguous with the work of Galton and Carl Pearson and Ron, Ronald Fisher into the 20th century, where they're doing things with probability and statistics that had for them the highest possible stakes. And in their case, the story that I tell in the book is their involvement in the eugenics movement, which I think animated the intellectual projects of all three of those people. I think they were basically devotees to the cause of eugenics and they were using statistics and developing statistical methods to bolster those ideas or to give them a kind of scientific authority that they wanted to use to advocate for the eugenics movement because they saw it as the stakes were all of society, the, the the downfall of society was at risk or was on the table. And so they, so they sought out that kind of authority, that objective frequencies, frequentist statistical methods seem to offer to them. And I think that is the, the final victory of frequentism was basically due to the advocacy of people like Fisher, who was just amazingly influential and domineering person and managed to argue people into submission to think about statistics his way and kill off Bayesianism, at least for a little while, and that we're still paying the price of that. So I think that, unfortunately, there is a kind of path dependency in the history of statistics and science where people are trained to use methods a certain way when they're coming up as students, and then they publish with those methods, and then they become professors, and they teach those methods, and then become journal uh, reviewers and editors, and they only accept papers that kind of use that methodology and that language, and then it just reinforces itself. And so 
in a way, I think we're still riding the momentum of that kind of historical moment when Fisher decided Bayesianism was over, but it's colliding with a wall of the replication crisis. And so I think it is creating a lot more possibilities now for people to take a step back, rethink statistical methodology and say, maybe we've been doing things wrong this whole time for the last hundred years. But that is really the kind of narrative, I think, of the book is that people came into this because of the relationship between statistics and social science and the kind of discomfort that people felt or the, and the authority that they sought out by trying to ground things in objective facts rather than subjective judgments and interpretation. And I think you still see that in, in the kinds of debates that people have about Bayesianism, that the number one kind of accusation people levy against it is that it's subjective and it's arbitrary. And these other methods are there objective and empirical, which is just nonsense. It's ridiculous. And it's a completely backwards way of thinking about scientific philosophy. But that's where we are. Yeah, I agree that these are topics interesting right now, because as you say, the re reproducibility crisis could be actually an opportunity to a chance to try and make that all over. And uh, we talked about that in episode 18 with uh, Daniel Lackens, actually, who is big, uh, who works a lot on, on the reproducibility crisis. And he was uh, actually quite open to uh, Bayesian met methods, because once you get a, a more open mind, you can have to, uh, to consider that. And also from what I see in this podcast, which is, of course, a biased sample and with a positive bias, of course, is that also the advent of like advanced statistical computing on your personal laptop with open source packages like Stan or PyMC or TensorFlow or Turing in Julia, which are free and which are sound probabilistically and scientifically, that helps tremendously. And the package by Paul Berkner, for instance, BRMS in the R ecosystem has helped a lot of people going from classic frequent statistics to Bayesian statistics because they were stuck in what they were doing and they had to try something else. And once they tried Bayesian stats, they discovered it was super, it was like really tailored to what they needed. And so they switched to that. And in the Python world, you've got Bambi, the Bambi package, which helps people do that. In R, it's BRMS and these kind of like very concrete projects, small step actually, like in the grand scheme of things, that seems like super, to be super small, but it's actually super beneficial because then people now have an easy alternative to at least try out and see how that goes. And you can really see that in people coming here in the podcast. And I often cite this episode 40 with uh, Timo Rodger and Alison Hilger because it's like really the example of people being almost base came to them. It's as if Paul Bjorkner came to them and told them, oh, like, try that maybe. And now they are using Bayesian stats all, all the time. So it's really a concrete declination of what you just said. Yeah, I think it, it is great. And I think that advances in computing have definitely made Bayesian methods more popular, more accessible to people. I think I, I agree with that only up to a certain point, though, because I think there's plenty of Bayesian stats you can do analytically in lots of different examples. And you can write down solutions for things like conjugate priors and why not? So I think if people had been open to that from the beginning, then there might have been a lot of tools that would have been developed that didn't require advanced computers to, to calculate. But I, I do agree that I think it's just an unfortunate feature of Bayesian stats that you a lot of times end up with these problems combining priors and posteriors or priors and likelihoods and trying to calculate things in your posterior distribution that you can't do analytically and it's actually really hard to do it even approximately. And I think that going back to reading Fisher and others, you can get the sense that they were really drawn to the beauty of the analytical solutions that they were able to produce for the kind of frequentist questions that they set up for themselves. Whatever assumptions about populations being normal, and then you want to compute the sampling distribution of the correlation coefficient, like you can do that. And Fisher solved that problem in a very beautiful way and so I think it's natural to then get tempted to think that must be very important because look at this beautiful solution I came up with. That must be something that is going to really mean something to people when actually it was the wrong question to be asking from the very beginning. And if they'd been asking the right kinds of questions, they might have been led to problems that don't have analytical solutions. But so what? That's that at least it would have been the right question to be asking. Or I make it the case in the book that 
there are probably some things like sufficient statistics that Fisher was more drawn to because he could compute things about them or he could prove these theorems about them when there are plenty of examples you can conjure up when there is no sufficient statistic. And so he might have, if you had cared less about being able to prove these theorems, you might have allowed yourself to investigate those kinds of problems and you might have been led to an understanding that maybe sufficient statistics aren't all that important, which they're not. So yeah, I think these these things do play off each other, but it's a kind of palatable party line that it was because we didn't have supercomputers in the 1920s. That's why frequentism won. But I, I almost think that's it's a little bit too simplistic. Yeah, oh, definitely. But that's one of the one of the factors. And also, yeah, just you won't have like. But that's a, one of the obstacles that I see is that some fields like really want an analytical solution, and it's just it's to me much too high expectation, like a completely unrealistic expectation because. It's, as soon as you start asking really important scientific questions, then the, the solutions are not there analytically. It's just it's so it's such a complex problem, and and then that means that you shoot yourself in the foot because <laughs> you can't work on very interesting problems. Right. But you have to work on really small questions that may not be very interesting, as you say. Maybe you get a right answer but to the wrong question. And so maybe you'd rather have maybe less right answer but to the right question, yeah. which is what you're trying to get with um, Bayesian stat when you're applying MCMC methods. And also the last part that I answer to that often, samples are actually great. Like once you get samples back from your MCMC sampler, they are much, much easier to work with than an analytical solution. Because if you only rely on the analytical solution, you have to know a lot of math. And I think now, many more people now how to handle computer code and programming languages like Python and R and many people know how to do that many more than people who know how to derive solutions, mathematical solutions analytically. So in the end, having the samples is a blessing because you can ask any questions you want on them and you know how to handle them. So which is something like sometimes it's like it's it's a shame to have samples and not an analytical solution. Not sure. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. I think, you know, there's there's so much you can do once you free yourself from having to do things analytically. And why should you? You're, we're, we're talking about yeah, yeah. applied science. We don't need an exact formula. 99% of the time, an approximation is great. And that's then that, that allows you to really ask the questions that you care about. Yeah, yeah. And like the, these stuff are important. Like sometimes analytical solutions are useful. And, and you do need some math sometimes to, to make your computations easier. Some algebra tricks and so on. Like all the work that's being done on Gaussian processes, for instance, is but finding out, coming up with mathematical approximation to make the Gaussian processes this great power that's super hard to, to yield, like being able to yield it with a computational cost that's acceptable to practitioners. So definitely these two go uh, hand in hand and, and opposing them like that, it, like again, it's shooting you in the foot. No, yeah, absolutely. I, I say all that as a theoretical mathematician, as someone who, yeah, that is my background. And, and I love those theorems and I love the analytical solutions. But I think, yeah, just as you say, it's too much to try to ask that there should be an analytical solution before you can start just playing around with things and then mm -hmm. exploring and computing answers to the real questions that you're facing then in the practice of actual science and statistics. Yeah, exactly. Okay, time is flying by, but I, so I want to ask you, where do we go from there? Uh, do you have a, an idea of how we can correct the course? Like we already talked a bit about that, but maybe some other structured ideas that you have in mind? Yeah, well, so mostly I think what I have to offer now is just destructive impulses. So I think I would say the first thing we need to do is just stop with frequentist statistics and stop telling people that probability means frequency and stop using that whole kind of language around probability and statistics. And that that then implies a lot of other things we need to stop doing and stop talking about significance and stop talking about p-values and maximum likelihood methods and sufficient statistics and unbiased estimators and basically take about 90% of the core statistics curriculum and just throw it in the trash can because it's all based on bad logical reasoning and fallacies that you can demonstrate very easily and I think should make you, should lead you to the conclusion that there's no value to any of those techniques. And so what's left is probability as logic, probability as a kind of statement of uncertainty that you could assign to a proposition based on background information, 
And once you get your head around that and you state and prove Bayes' theorem, which is the only really non-trivial theorem of probability anyway, then you've got everything you need. And so the rest of it is, okay, now let's learn some Bayesian stats technique techniques and learn some computing techniques and learn you know, how to define models of different sorts of structures and what might be appropriate for different kinds of problems. But I think the number one thing that first needs to happen is people need to just excise the language of frequentist statistics and probability, which has been around for a very long time. And so that's not going to be, that's not an easy task on its own, but I think that is the necessary precursor to reconstructing that, that school of inference based on, on Bayesian techniques. And I think the other thing that comes along with it is, as I've hinted at in the book, really examining the role of data in making inferences and examining the kind of st- scientific philosophy that tells you that you can make conclusions just from data without any kind of prior and subjective assessment on the part of the observer. I think if that's a toxic suggestion and a dangerous idea of scientific inference. And so we also have to start over, I think, when we, t- when we train the next generation of scientists and statisticians to not think of statistics as this kind of perfectly objective crystalline thing, but actually as a tool to assemble assignments that you have based on your prior understanding of the world and the things you might assume that are wrong, but you can test them or you can replace them with things that are less wrong if you allow yourself to consider the alternatives in light of the observations and do the kind of probability updating that, that Bayes' rule tells you, or Bayesian thinking guides you to do. So I think that's it's an, it's an approach to our place in the world and our place as scientists and how much of it is dependent on our own kind of situated knowledge and our perspective that I think people need to get their heads around before we can really move forward. So yeah, two just extremely large monumental tasks, but that's all we have to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah on both enthusiastic and depressed when I hear that. <laughs> because I mean, that in a perfect world, and that could be the answer to the first question of the last two I ask at the end of the show, that could be that. But then I, like, I'm like, yeah, but it will take so much time because that means a lot of people would have to be to agree to do that. And the only thing I see that's possible is incremental improvements and just making sure that people start talking together and exchanging ideas about how statistics can be taught and so on. So yeah, definitely something that'd be great. And I think an incremental improvement that maybe a low hanging fruit would be at least to add one more module of Bayesian statistics in, in, in university. Just by the way, this exists and this has sound mathematical and statistical groundings and that's actually older than the default statistic right now. So yeah, let's take a look at that and see in which cases that would be most useful. Because again, it's not like you should apply that all the time. It's that there are some cases where Bayesian statistics are really custom tailored for these use, these use cases. So just use that. And same thing for Sometimes you are really interested in frequencies and you can really repeat the experience, the experiments lots of and lots of times. So then you can use frequency statistics with no problem, adapt to the problem in question, I'd say. Yeah. And as a Bayesian statistician, I say I I will take that taste test challenge with frequentist stats any day of the week. So I think that's (laughs) a wonderful idea. Let's present both of them to students and say, which one of these kind of sounds more attractive to you. And by the way, oh, yeah. the Bayesian stats paradigm, it it encompasses everything that you love about frequentist stats. If you have no prior information, then sure, you can ignore prior distributions and you'll come to reasonable conclusions. That's a special yeah. case, but there are many other cases. And let me tell you about all those. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I love that. Because actually, once you start using Bayesian stats and just use uniform priors everywhere, you can see how silly that can be in many, in uh, actually how silly that is in many circumstances. And that just having no idea, like pretending to have no idea of what you're uh, studying is completely silly and just doesn't make your model simple and, and converge. And then you see that, oh yeah, actually like not every information is in the data. Right. There is a lot of information outside of the data and I have to put that in the model to make my model converge and try to answer the question I'm interested in. You know some things about it, otherwise you wouldn't have thought to do the experiment in the first place. And you have yeah, yeah. a rough sense of what the size of the effect or whatever it is that you're studying because mm. things about 
the world and the way thing, they work. So if you have a vocabulary for including that information, then I think it can be a very powerful tool. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that point because it's really also, it's really concrete because most of the people I see who switch to Bayesian stats are actually drawn by that more by technical necessity and real practical matters and a lot less by physi philosophical matters. They then dive into that and usually love that. But the first, what drove them to Bayesian stats are the practicality of doing that. And if you can just show people, yeah, try that model with just completely uniform prior and with a normal likelihood, because that's what you're used to and just see how that goes. And you'll see that in the end, you will want to add information because you will uh, notice that, okay, I can't answer the question I'm interested in. And actually then when you want to interpret the results, you can really interpret your results as the probability that the true, the true value is between these bound and this upper bound and this lower bound. <laughs> you can actually answer the question that you want to ask, which is, I think, the yeah. most attractive thing about Bayesian inference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, before closing up the show, I have I had a ton of other questions for you. But just one question before going to the uh, last two ones is, what are the main skills that you are trying to instill in your readers through your book? Yeah, so I think thinking in a Bayesian way is the main skill. And I should clarify, you know, the book is not a textbook. I think it, it yeah. could definitely be suitable for students, and I, I would love for it to be used in university courses, but I think it doesn't have exercises and it's not really organized as a textbook. But I think you know, there's one essential idea, which is when you're doing a probabilistic inference, you need to think through the prior probability you have for a hypothesis, the, the sampling probability for the observation alternative hypotheses in their priors. And if you're able to put all those pieces together, then the inference just falls out. And if you get practice with doing that, then I think what it trains you to do is look for those ingredients in any kind of problem that you are faced with. So I think what I mostly want to equip people with is the skill of asking the right questions. If you're on a jury and a prosecutor presents this evidence that if the suspect were innocent, then the facts of the case would be so unlikely, you should immediately stop and raise your hand and say, but what is the prior probability of them having committed the crime? Or what are the alternatives that we're meant to consider? And, and if you're getting a diagnosis and a doctor talk, starts talking about the accuracy rates of tests that you should say, but what is the rate of incidence of the, of the disease for people like me? Or how do we process that into a posterior probability assignment? So I think that's the kind of knee-jerk reflex that I want people to come out of the book just having. And once you have that, then I think you also start to question statistical orthodoxy and you start to read these papers about significant findings or statistical significance. And you should have the same kind of reflexive um, reaction to them and say, but, okay, but what is, what's the prior assignment to that effect? What are the alternatives under consideration? Yeah. yeah, that's the habit of thinking. Yeah, basically, what's the baseline also? Like often, yeah, it's super important to ask that. Yeah, so often, like an example I love is um, I think I, I talked about that with David Spiegel Hunter is um, autonomous uh, vehicles. Each time they have a problem, everybody's go, oh, "That's so dangerous," and so on. But look at humans driving <laughs> ve vehicles; like it's really, really not safe. So compared to that, not to an idealized world where there are absolutely no accidents. So yeah, basically baseline super. Important. Okay, maybe really quickly. Any projects that you are working on uh, for the coming months and are uh, especially exciting? Well, mostly I'm you know, trying to promote the book and, and talk to people about the book and solicit their reactions. I think that I'm very excited to hear about where this treatment kind of lands with people who are both new to it and maybe have never read much about Bayesian stats, but also people who are very steeped in this discourse and are familiar with these arguments. I think that there's something there for everybody. It's I meant it to be accessible to newcomers, but also to include some of the ideas from Jane's that I think are very difficult for people to really get into and are from, you know, 2003. So more kind of recent developments even since then. And I, what I'd love to hear is just what people's reactions are and how they might find a use for that in their scientific work or their research work or classrooms if they're teaching stats or if they're teaching social science methods. Um, so that's the main kind of project that I have in mind. I'm also going to be teaching this spring and organizing classes around logic and philosophy of probability. And I'm very excited about 
a project I like to call Surviving the Pandemic, where I don't get COVID and die. It's been a passion project of mine for the last 18 months and something that I'm, I'm still committed to. And I think that for the foreseeable future, I'm going to be occupied with that as well. Okay. You can join me if you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before letting you go, as usual, I'm going to ask you two questions. I ask every guest at the end of the show. First one, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Such a tough one. I'm probably supposed to say something like the Riemann hypothesis or the Kolatz conjecture or something like that. I think for me, the idea that's left out of Jane's or the kind of main gap in Jane's presentation is Cox's theorem, the kind of mathematical theorem that, that says that probability is fundamental in some sense. I think There are assumptions in that theorem that are need, in need of clarification. There are ways in which the theorem is inadequate to the purpose that it, it's really being used for. And I've tried writing some about shoring up some of those problems in Cox's theorem, but I think that's probably if I really you know, wanted to do a, a deep dive, that's where I would probably go, is rethinking the fundamentals of Cox's theorem, which is really, when you get down to it, it's the fundamentals of probability and of reasoning with plausibilities in a quantitative way. And what are the kind of properties that we think that that sort of plausible reasoning should satisfy? And what James calls the desiderata, I would want to understand what are the other possible properties that it could satisfy or why are those the right properties? And what are the kind of other models of probability that could come out of different sets of um, axioms almost? So that's a big topic, but I think it's one that's needed because people criticize the Jamesian treatment on, on the basis of Cox's theorem not really being the thing that he wanted it to be in the book. And, and you can get a sense of that when you read it. Hmm. So who knows how long that would take, but that would be fun to go on that adventure. Yeah, yeah definitely. And second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? Right, so you probably have already guessed the obvious answer would be Jane's. Yeah. Although I actually think it would be an awkward dinner because I essentially wrote 347 page love letter to Jane's. I don't know what really more I could say, except do you like me? Check this box. Yes or no. Mm -hmm. It would be like an awkward crush. But if I could have a second guess, I, I was thinking earlier that probably the person that I've read about that I'd love to get to know more better was William Gossett, mm -hmm. published under the name Student. And I think this, the stories that you hear about him are just amazing that in Ziliak and McCloskey's book, I think they call him the Woody Guthrie of statistics, that he was just this kind of eccentric, the best kind of weird, eccentric nerd hobbyist who loved to go hiking and could probably you know, tell you all of the names of the mushrooms and the berries in the forest and would make his own fishing boat out of wood that he found in the forest and just tell you about cool bugs that he found and so on. I think he just, he had so many amazing things to talk about, in addition to being the head experimental brewer at the Guinness, the Guinness Distillery. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure he'd have lots of things to bring to the party and uh, would be an amazing person to hang out with. He was also, historically, he was the mediator of this great feud between Fisher and Pearson. And so I think it would be fascinating to hear kind of the perspective of someone who was close to both of those people yeah. in the middle of that. And trying to understand which of their ideas were actually useful and right and, and maybe calling each of them out on some of their mistakes and things that they were committing themselves to and ways that they had been wrongheaded. So I think he's just a fascinating person. I don't know a lot, a lot about him, but I'd love to get to know more. Yeah, me too. Please tell me if these dinners. Yeah, happen. sure, sure. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Aubrey. That was uh, such a pleasure to, to welcome you on the show. And as expected, the conversation really was really a, a natural flow. Uh, and I could have asked you uh, many more questions But a uh, three-hour show is a bit too much, so we'll stop there. But uh, you'll definitely come back for, for the other format, the matchmaking dinner. I have some ideas of people you could be paired with already. As usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Uh, of course, I encourage people to read your book. I'm, I'm going to do that very soon. Thank you again, Aubrey, for taking the time and being on this show. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, you bet. Take care. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. 
I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn bass stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good bassy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good bassy and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation.